post. Boom. Everyone, welcome. Welcome to the July 13th edition of the weekly community call for chaos. Uh, I'm Elizabeth. I'm the community manager here, so I'm very happy to see you all. I don't think we have anybody new on the call. It looks like it's mostly the usual suspects. So welcome, happy to see everybody. Thanks for taking time to hang out with us uh, for this hour or half an hour in some cases. <laughs> so um, yeah, let's get right into it. We posted the meeting minutes here. And if you have not added your name yet and you'd like to do that, please feel free to do so. And also tell us one good thing or two good things, however many good things you want to tell us about that are going on in your life recently. Um, that'd be great. We would love to see that. We have a few things on our agenda today. It uh, looks like most of the things are from previous meetings and such and, and old topics, but we did have a few announcements that we wanted to make um, real quick for everybody. Uh, the first one is that um, we meant to put this in the newsletter. It was my bad. It, I didn't get it in there. Um, the Grace Hopper Open Source Day is happening this week. And um, Sean is going to be uh, representing chaos with the Augur project. Um, and that's happening on Thursday. So thank you, Sean, for doing that. And um, do you have anything you want to say about that or add? I know we've done these in the past, but is there something you want to add? Yeah, this is um, uh, Biturgia and Augur both did it in the fall. And I, I think we both encountered some challenges with the virtual environment. And so this is kind of an experiment to see how the virtual Grace Hopper goes, and they're actually doing two of these open source days virtually this year, one uh, this month and then one in October. So there's still an opportunity for other parts of chaos to participate in the fall version. I think what we're doing here in the summer is pilot testing some of their collaboration strategies to see how we can do this better virtually. But yeah, we'll see, we'll see what it is. And I will report back next week. Yeah, that, that would be great. They, they had reached out to some folks individually about helping to run an open source hackathon at the mm -hmm. October one. So I, I didn't, I was, I'd be curious to know how we're engaging as chaos in terms of what the presence actually looks like. Um, I, I didn't sign up for that, but I'm not opposed to participating in, in Grace Hopper. I was actually just talking about it today. So if there's another way to, to work in it that I don't, that's I, not I, available myself. <laughs> yeah, may, uh, if you don't mind, if, and if there's anyone else interested, what I can do is just pass your contact info along to the people that we've been working with to have them maybe reach out to you individually. I, I really do think they're still figuring out the virtual part. And I think we all are, but like a virtual hackathon is a tricky thing with when nobody knows anybody. And yeah. I, well, that's why I didn't want to sign up for that because I feel like I, I would be more of like the, I have no idea what's going on. Please tell me what to do, which is not necessarily helpful. Yeah. Yeah, and, I, and I'm just, I just decided after last fall, I'll dive into the abyss and see if we can figure some things out and maybe make this falls go a little better. Cool, thanks. Yeah. Awesome, any other questions, comments, feedback, anything for Sean? All right, well, we look forward to hearing how that went, Sean. Thank you again for doing that on behalf of Chaos. We appreciate you. Yep, and if anyone else wants to have a, personal invitation or like have their info contacted to the people we're actually working with or forwarded to them, just let me know. You can message me on Slack or that's probably the best way. Awesome. Okay. Um, the second thing is that, so that's happening on Thursday. And then on Friday, uh, we are going to, I think, be migrating our website to our new um, hosting company which the website itself will look the same, um, but on the back end is where all of the improvements and um, we'll have a lot more functionality um, and a lot more control over what we can um, install the plugins and, and things like that. So um, Kevin, I don't know if you want to say a little bit about that yet, or if you want to wait until it's done and give us a, a, a feedback report or however you want to do it. Uh, actually, so the, the switch is actually going to happen on Wednesday. Uh, the oh, Linux Foundation IT support rightfully pointed out that making a switch like that on a Friday is a bad idea. Yeah, uh, that, was, that was a really yeah. good, a really good <laughs> insight on their part. Yep, um, us uh, not having deployed new websites in a really long time. <laughs> uh, so it, it'll be uh, the the following Wednesday we'll make the switch. Uh, the new the new site is actually live now at chaos.info. Uh, and I think I, uh, 
I would, would be. Yeah, go ahead, Sean. I was just going to say, Kevin and I would really like it if a couple people could just click through chaos.info and see if you find anything that breaks that that doesn't seem to break on regular chaos.community. I don't think anything should break on either site, but you know we've tested it, but we are limited in what we can test. So if anybody else has a minute to just go click around and identify if there's anything broken that we're not aware of, that would be very helpful. We would have a higher confidence yeah. if it's not up to us. I will do a QA pass. If anybody Thank else you. wants to coordinate to take other pages, we're all just posting the um, in the channel. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And and I guess we should maybe give, if you find an issue, where should people report that, Kevin, in our in our GitHub channel, or should they open an issue on the website repo? Uh, the uh, the website repo issue would be the uh, okay. that would be ideal. That way, if it's a okay. uh, if it's a feature improvement or a bug that will be a that can be addressed after the migration, I'm I'm starting to make a list of those. So uh, additionally, we're going to be uh, following the website migration. We are going to be doing a uh, uh, an accessibility audit on the on the website. So uh, so following the migration, uh, we will be looking at making improvements. So feel free to uh, mention improvements or make feature requests on the uh, the site. Uh, additionally, we've reset all of the uh, uh, admin and editor access for the new site. So if you would like some sort of access to the site, uh, perhaps we should uh, collect names for that. Uh, admin access, editor access, uh, blog access. Uh, I'm not sure how we want to uh, assign permissions. Uh, but I'm, I'm certainly open to having more people with, with access to the site at this point uh, to help manage content. I also wanted to give a shout out to Matt G and Matt Snell, sorry, Matt Cantu for um, their, also their work on this team. Cause I know it's been a, a, a group effort. Uh, Kevin's lead, Kevin and Sean are leading, um, but yeah. So thank you to all of you and thank you to Lucas for uh, volunteering to help test and do a QA pass. Is there anything else to talk about with this? Add uh, co comments, feedback. What else do we want to talk about? All right, then I guess we can go on. <laughs> Thanks for changing your name, Matt. <laughs> I won't. I won't remember otherwise. One so thank you. question: If we do see anything, should we just pin you in the? in the Slack or submit a PR? Like what's the best way to say if you do have any issues or see any issues with the website? Uh, a GitHub issue is the best way. However, uh, a Slack message, I will I will certainly respond to. And honestly, a Slack message actually might be faster. Uh, but but a GitHub issue would be the, uh, the preferred method. So. All right. Okay then we can go ahead. So that will be again happening on Wednesday, July 21st will be the switch over to that. Uh, let's see, okay, the next thing on our list is to let you all know that um, we are hosting another of our Augur workshops on Saturday, July 17th. Uh, so if you're interested in that, I should have posted the registration link. I did not do that, um, but I will do that uh, if I can do more than one thing at one time, which would It'd be amazing if I could, but I can't. So <laughs> if somebody else has that handy, wants to do that, fine. Um, if not, I'll do it after meeting. Um, but that is happening on Saturday uh, morning for US Central slash Chicago time. And that will be Sean again hosting that. So Sean has a very busy week this week. Thank you, Sean, for being awesome. Um, any questions busy, about that? At least. How are those going, Sean, in terms of attendance? The uh, we get about anywhere from two to five people, and this is the summer, so I'm expecting less participation, but I could be surprised. That's pretty good. Yeah, I mean, I'm it's it's a and it's a good number. I mean, I think if it was twenty people, it'd be really hard to manage. I would need more people. But is it the same people every time? No, it's been different people. So okay, yeah. that's good. Yeah. Yeah, we'll I think it's about that too, Sean. Sorry. Yeah, it's been um, useful. It's been a, it's been a, it's been you know one way to get people involved in the more technical aspects of the chaos project. And 
So we'll keep trying things like this. Any other questions for Sean? Okay, um, so we'll go ahead. The next item is that the GSOC first evaluations are due this week. So mentors of our GSOC students, if you could get those written and submitted, that would be fantastic. Um, not sure what else to add to that. Besides the reminder, just don't forget to do that. I will just also say that our GSOC students, as usual, are just absolutely amazing. And we're really, really thankful for all of them. And you're all doing a, a really, really great job. Um, it's it's mind blowing how much work it's done. So thank you guys. <laughs> thank you all for doing such a good job. Um, if you're missing the uh, updates, they usually end up in the newsletter or on Slack or in the mailing list. So um, that's where those happen. If you're not if you're not participating in any of those places, um, then you should be. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, do we want to take a minute and let I see Yash, Andrew, both are here on the call. Just let them give a quick you know, 30 second update of how it's going. How about let's do that real quick. Yash, do you want to go first? Yep. Sorry to pick sure. on the spot. So, no issues. So the MAR system is actually the main coding part is done. And this week we'll mainly be focusing on the documentation. And we plan to open the system for user testing next week. So you all all be able to, you know, go and explore. And if you find any bugs, you can report it. That would be great. That's all. And That's after awesome. that, we'll be focusing on the release of the translated metrics. Uh, we already the translated metrics release has never been done before, so we are trying to first create a, a set of guidelines, and we'll be discussing this further in the Asia Pacific call tomorrow. And after that, we'll be automating the process of translated metrics release also. We can use some we can use some input on what this process would look like. So if you have thoughts, please, please do join us tomorrow. I have a link to the doc in case anyone wants to review it. I'll be posting it on the mailing list today. OK, perfect. Thank you. Uh, if you missed it, the doc is in the chat, the Zoom chat for anyone who was who missed that. It's right there that Yash just posted. All right. And then Drew, do you want to say a quick update of how things are going for you? Yeah, so uh, we just what okay, sorry, it's it was my microphone. So we just finished implementing scorecard. Uh, it took longer than I expected. I thought I'll just do it in a week or so, but well, uh, bugs. And now I'm building a new worker for Libya to which would calculate dependency freshness. So it's it's really amazing because you know having uh, uh, having getting an opportunity to build a worker from scratch is is just amazing. So. Yeah, it's amazing. I like to hear that. Amazing. Wow, this is amazingly complex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll put it. It's fun too. Yeah. And just for um, those of us who may not know, what is dependency freshness? What is that? So a uh, lot of projects. So we ha have different versions of dependencies like Flask 1.1.1, someone would be using, and it might have a vulnerability, uh, which would like, basically it's a vulnerability that extends to a project. So it's always a good idea to up keep them updated. Uh, so it just uh, measures that, you know, gets to the package files, looks at your dependency versions, and then you know, let you know that you might be behind, you must update. That's Awesome, okay, that makes sense. Uh, any questions for Yash or Dhruv? All 
All right, we will go on then. That was a little sidetrack of announcements, but it's kind of announcements. Status updates are also announcements, I guess. Um, okay, so the next one is that the Chaos Slack is now the free version. We did talk about this a little bit last week, um, actually quite a, quite a bit last week, and we decided that the, um, the free version of Slack was going to be just fine for our needs for now. So that has now happened. So if anybody sees those little messages popping up, we know about that and it's a deliberate purposeful choice. So, so don't worry about it. It's okay. It's all good. And in the future, if we find that it's not serving our needs uh, any longer, then we will talk about payment and upgrading. But for now, we're good. Last minute questions on that? All right, rock on. Moving forward, I love it. So we had a few action items from previous meetings, and this has been a couple of meetings ago. So um, if we haven't talked about it, if you don't remember, it's totally fine. We can you know bring it up again next week. But um, the first one is data ethics considerations. We've been talking about adding something to our template, our PR template. And I know that like um, the the automation and the website migration kind of is putting a little wrench in that in that so um, that may wait if i'm not mistaken i believe that's what we were talking about uh kevin but you can um, update us on that if if that's okay yeah so actually in the uh i believe it's in the in the metrics repo we've been having a discussion in the interview or in the in the issues about adding uh both a, a data ethics disclaimer and and also a, a dei disclaimer to the metrics template uh, and where we're, where we're, where the discussion is at right now, and it is, I think it's an ongoing conversation, but where, where the discussion is at right now is kind of leaning towards keeping the metrics templates simple and moving, moving those disclaimers to the, uh, the website page where we display the, the, the metrics in general. So there already is a, a data, data ethics, uh, disclaimer there, uh, but so the there's a talk of kind of editing that a little bit, possibly linking out to a larger uh, data ethics document, and also possibly adding a a DEI uh, disclaimer to the metrics as well. But the, the DEI addition is not a disclaimer. It's really yeah. how the metric could be used to better understand DEI. Yeah, disclaimer is probably, I mean, yeah, it's, yeah, they're both, I think, more, um, yeah, the EI one is pragmatic application, and I think the data one is a value statement, like where we, what we're trying to accomplish and how we're working to respect people's privacy with the data. I, I've un, I understood it as, as two separate things. One is kind of a use yep. case for DEI, so DEI can... DEI can inform the use case for most of the metrics that we have, uh, but where the where the disclaimer comes in is that most metrics have some have some connection to DEI, right? So uh, it's important to, in the in the use of metrics, it's important to consider to consider DEI issues. So I believe that does need to be a. a I, I think we do need some sort of a disclaimer around that the same way that we have to have a disclaimer around data ethics, right? So, but I believe those are, those are two kind of separate issues. We could, we can provide some guidance on use cases for the objective section in the metrics template. Uh, but the, but I, I do think we do need some sort of DEI disclaimer as well. And, but not on the metrics template, that would be more uh, on the, the metrics release page. Well, then could we, on the PR, the 192, I mean, could we kind of get rid of like the talks about ethics and disclaimers? Because really all that this pull request was about was just trying to include a heading or a subheading. I think the last, the last two comments, the last two comments in that issue, or maybe the last three comments in that issue by myself and Georg, uh landed in that in that area okay so the it's not yeah we're not talking about the disclaimer anymore we're now talking about guidance in the objective section uh specifically in the objective section of the template 
to address DEI use cases. Okay, well, I'll uh, go so, change that then in the PR. Yeah. So, but uh, I think we had, the where we were where we were talking was not about ha adding another header. It's more about just providing guidance on, hey, please consider DEI in your use cases when you are uh, writing the objectives for this metric. And Georg is here, so he can uh, either say yes, that's what we talked about, or, or no, we were having a completely different discussion, Kevin. The one sentence I heard was in line with what I remember us talking about. I'm sorry? I said that the one sentence that I just heard resonates with a conversation we had on the issue this or pull request. Yeah, the, the metrics template uh, pull request. Uh, correct. Okay, well, I'll update the file then. <coughs> but so going back to the, the issue that started this, uh, adding a metrics disclaimer to the metrics template or ad adding an ethics disclaimer to the template may just create a uh, replication and redundancy that we don't need if we're trying to make these metrics templates as simple as possible. So the uh, I think where we're at right now is we, we believe that the ethics disclaimer is better served on the metrics release page. And perhaps we can link out to a, a larger metrics document or a larger ethics document uh, from there. Okay, any other comments or questions about this? I mean, we can also continue the discussion in the PR um, that Matt dropped in the um, in the chat, if there are people have feelings about this, you want to chime in on the conversation, I think that's probably a good place to do that. But if nobody else has anything on this, um, we can move forward, if that's okay. Um, so the next kind of piece of that was um, that Sophia had brought her information from a talk that she did with a few others um, who were also in the Chaos Project and other places. Um, she brought that to us last week at the very tail end. And so we were gonna have a look at that um, and give thoughts back to her. I don't know if anybody's had a chance to do that, um, but we had also talked about maybe writing a blog post around data ethics and like kind of what our stance is around it. And um, maybe that would be in conjunction with that larger metrics release statement that you were talking about, Kevin. So um, what, do we, what do we feel about this? What do we wanna do? I mean, I, I like that idea in general. I think this is a big topic. So just putting a little like, oh, by the way, you should consider this and then not saying too much after that. Like, I think we have a, an opportunity to make a statement um, or at least just to like contribute to the conversation because I think it's very large and comprehensive. So I, I am a fan of, we could start it as a blog post. It could become a doc as, as Kevin mentioned on, on somewhere on the, the releasing page or guidance around metrics usage. Um, we can figure out where that lives later, but I think a blog is a great place to start um, or you could start it as a conversation. Either way, um, I just wanted to share this this doc as, as Elizabeth mentioned, just as we've, we had this as a, a MozFest discussion last year. Um, so essentially we prompted it with just who we were. It was myself, Daniel, um, from Paturgia and then another Googler just talking about three different personas that interact with this kind of data and sort of the ethical challenges that we face as say the community manager or contributor, the, the aggregator or platform, and then me as the, the controller uh, and maintainer of that amassed data set and what are the responsibilities to each individual party, kind of prefacing it with what how these things could be used in both corporate and community context, and then starting to pose questions and considerations for all those parties slash acknowledging that there are more, uh, more people involved in the chain. So I wanted to share the deck just 
as what we had started to outline in terms of some of those divisions, personas, questions, uh, ethical ambiguities, um, because we're not talking about owned stuff. I think once once you're, um, this is a recorded thing, so I'll, I'll be careful about how I, I say this. Uh, but in terms of say some companies, mm. like ourselves included, when you amass and create a data set, you can license it and license how it's used and tools like Kaggle that are designed to share data and resources like this. But often this kind of data is not actually classified as anything. In fact, our we have a, a public data set that's a mass collection of GitHub activity data and it's currently not licensed. Um, and you look at how the LF is doing it, it's, it's just kind of, there aren't actually any policies or restrictions drawn around the data. So it's kind of like, it's open for an individual's interpretation for how to use it responsibly, which is why I think there's so much open space to start a conversation about what does it actually mean to responsibly use this information in a way that everyone feels like their, their concerns are, are being met, um, especially for the end user who in this case is just because of GitHub's policy says that anything that they do can be shared through the GitHub API and get the GitHub API explicitly says that it can't use it for commercial purposes, but that's it. Um, so I think, again, there's a lot of room for just conversation, especially in, in the context of the community where you do know these people. And so you should, they, it should be a conversation, not just a, an assumption. Um, so basically I'm saying all of it to say that I, I'd love to help to craft that whenever we wanna move forward with it. I hope that we could use some of the, the concepts and idea here as a way to start ideas and ideas of where, where we wanna focus. But um, Dana and I were talking on, on a side channel about it might make sense to start, I don't wanna start yet another working group, um, but maybe some kind of like little pilot project that doesn't necessarily have to be maintained as an overall working group, but maybe it should be part of another one. So I'd be curious for this, for the team to think where, where does it make the most sense for a work like this to be done in the project? I would, I love recommend, I would recommend this to be part of common working group because like uh, in common we have it, there is nothing which is uh, usable for everyone and serves the entire community and doesn't fit in on any working group. We discuss those things in the common. So I would propose bringing this to the common working group and we can discuss it or maybe we don't create a metric, but it's a big uh, thing that is ongoing and it can support others too. So that is my suggestion. Yeah, I, I, so I guess I have a question, Sophia. So is there a like a, a hope that you would have from this work? Is it like helping people think through this or is it like to provide guidance for people as they work with this data? I think it's both. Like I think like in, in my context, I'm coming at it from a company where there are very stringent restrictions and regulations for how I use, store, and interact with data. But in a community, there isn't any of that. So it's more to help people understand what guidelines they should draw for themselves uh, in terms of using the data responsibly. And it's they have the opportunity to build their own culture and assumption around how data around their own projects are created. But I think the intended outcome is that people are more upfront with that intended usage of data. Because I think right now there's just sort of like, well, no one said anything, so it's not an issue. Um, and that, that's what I would like to change. Um, I don't necessarily think that whatever we propose will become the de facto standard. It's more to just help to encourage standards here, or at least standard practices that say you as a community leader have some sort of statement around how you plan to handle data like this. Um, or just what, and I guess this is about why you should care more than how you should do it. So I'm assuming we start with the why and then the how, um, and then the how is, could be, we had worked on our own sort of data usage statement. And that could be an example of like, well, chaos has had felt strongly about being transparent around how we use data and how we collect data and maintain it and maintain the integrity of it and security of it. This is our statement. And that's sort of beginning the conversation of like, how might you do this? 
So I, I like this a lot. Um, and I like Georg's suggestion of maybe five to 10 minutes. I think you're in the weekly call, Georg, because I think this certainly covers more than, it <laughs> covers all working groups, I think. Um, and listening to you talk, Sophia, like, I think there's questions that can be asked about how you would use data that is otherwise, you know, not data that you generated, but also trying to help provide guidance for people who are looking to use the data that you do generate. Um, I, I don't know. So like there's a, communities generate data themselves and like a statement of how we would like you to use the data <laughs> that comes from our community might be an interesting statement. Um, but I don't know like if that is superseded by like if we do all of our work on GitHub, for example, like it doesn't matter what we say, it falls to the GitHub policy. Like if in a community we said, we don't want you to analyze our data, period. Um, like I, I don't know, I, but this is I think kind of your point. Like it's not super clear in this area as to how we how we use this data. Yeah. Or present this data. I mean, also I guess we're part of the LF. So the LF has a, a public statement that they have more restrictions around the use of telemetry data, but contribution data they consider to be entirely public. Um, so with the LF Insights dashboards, they have they have people's names explicitly listed and next to their contribution levels, and they view that as entirely public data. And that's a stance that the LF has taken. Um, I, I've seen other organizations haven't said anything at all. <laughs> so that's the starting place, but then also they choose to say that telemetry data is more, has more restrictions around how you use it and how you publish back to it. And so they, they've made that statement in regards to data around LF projects. Um, so that, that's the one example where we can look at in terms of how the LF is treating this, these kinds of ambiguities. It's still honestly pretty ambiguous too. Like I didn't realize that contributed data was not considered telemetry data and that there's not really a clean distinction on what those two pieces are. But again, room for conversation. <laughs> I agree. I, I like this. I like it. I do too. It was very helpful. I like it a lot too. And I think that it, we can use, you know, a few minutes of this call to do like a little working session, just like how we develop our metrics. We just have a doc and we all will jump in and, and add our, uh, our comments. So um, I don't know if someone wants to start that doc and we can even, you know, next week could be the first time that we um, take five minutes to do that. If, if everyone's okay with that, that's cool. Any strong feelings against that? No, it'd be, it'd be cool too. This would be like the first time we would really use this call as a working session. So the first time in a long since yeah. three years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not like never, but. I mean, is that okay? Do we have bad feelings about that? Do we want to like keep that boundary in place or are we okay with? No, I actually, no, not at all. And in fact, I think this is a good feeling about it. Topics that kind of um, like hits all corners of the chaos project and the most sensible place for it would be to have it here. Makes sense, makes sense. And I do like the fact that we get people on this call that can't attend other calls, but also want to participate. So that would be great. Um, so who wants to volunteer to take that action item to start the doc? Georg is already raising his hand, so. He's already probably done. <laughs> it's probably already done, right? <laughs> He's so on top of things. Oh man, I, I, should, I should be so, so amazing and be on top of things. Like I just, yeah, I don't think that's ever gonna happen, but I can strive, reach for the stars. Okay, thank you, Georg. And thank you, Sophia. I really appreciate your insights with all of this. Um, so much great stuff to add. I just, I love it. I, mean, I, like, the, I like the blog post idea because it could be, I mean, the first blog post could be basically, we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> like we're, we're just trying to figure this out. So if you're interested in coming and joining the conversation, yeah, please join. Is that a separate action item then for someone to write that blog post, that kind of introductory, <laughs> like, hey, here's something we're going to do. Yes. And we could use your help. Sure. I can, I can do that. Awesome. Thank you, Matt. Amazing. So productive today. I can't even stand it. This is so great. Um, okay, we're going to move forward because we only have 10 minutes and we do have a few other things to talk about. So let's hop along to the next thing. 
Um, the next one is we want to talk a little bit about Zoom security. Um, we have not had any issues since the one day, thankfully, but um, there had been concerns in the past that you know, if, if no one's in the Zoom channel, how do we know that someone's not using it while we're not there? Um, so that has been a, a concern. And the other concern is um, for the office hours of giving people the opportunity who are hosting to have that administrative control, which I think we solved that piece that um, I can, I give those credentials to if you're hosting the office hours, I can give you the credentials. So that way you do have control. And, and Matt C uh, did the office hours on Monday and he said there were, weren't any problems. So it, that could have just been a one-off time. Lucky you, Vinod, for having to deal with that. But um, so I guess that it goes back to um, what we wanna do. And I think Matt C, you said you were gonna look into some security options that we might have from Zoom. Yeah. I um I got most of this information actually off of a, off of the Zoom security pamphlet. They're pretty comprehensive um, with what you can do, and um, my so you've already covered one of the recommendations is sharing credentials to trusted users. There's something I wanted to bring up is that you've got more um, opportunities for issues to arise if you have more people with credentials. Is is generally how it goes, and I was wondering if we could start a chaos. Um, Zoom for office hours that's separate from the regular one so that people can't log in as chaos community to the regular one with their office hours login or whatever. Um, something I wanted to bring up. We don't have to answer that now. Um, the other one was um, adding a simple password, so, something that doesn't take a, take a lot of time to put in or add to the link. Because random Zoom bombing, I know, is not necessarily a common issue, but it is a consistent issue. It does happen, like, a lot. <laughs> Just, like, there's so many Zoom channels and so many random numbers you can put in that that doesn't happen to often to every group. So that's something I wanted to bring up, too. So our, our links are publicly posted. Right? So it's not a uh, adding adding the password at the end of uh, the publicly posted link wouldn't uh, wouldn't solve the issue. I just uh, I, I, I've known that people can put in a random number into zoom and occasionally get a channel. And um, the thing I'm wondering about is I don't think anybody's coming in to cause problems coming into the chaos community website because that's pretty far removed from like things you can search on Google and find a random zoom link if you want to find a zoom link to, to bomb basically. Um, I don't know how they found it, but I'm guessing that it came from a random link. Yeah, it might have been from Twitter because we do put it on Twitter and yeah, that's true. Notes, so. I don't know. Uh, there's not a lot of easy ways to do it. So one of the things is there a does anybody get an email when people come into the Zoom? Can we set that up? Because that would be one. We can look into that. Um, it might go to, see, the only problem is because the LF owns our Zoom account. The, yeah. the email that's listed is not one that we own. It's one that goes to them. And so we are limited on stuff we can set up and what we can't set up and who gets those notifications. Gotcha. Um, I think we looked at this when we first set this whole thing up, when we moved it from the UNO. And that was one of the things that was kind of a pain, but um, they do pay for it. Like LF pays for it. So um I mean, the other option would be us to pay for it ourselves. They and might be we can, well. They might be willing to change that email, or we might actually be able to change it. I don't know if we can change it or not. So something also I have in mind is that preventative measures are kind of limited with Zoom, whether or not you have the access to the main account. But I think guidelines are also important here. Um, it might be. It would be really important to have. Um, not necessarily a pamphlet that you give to people to say this is how you do it, but at least some kind of th something on the handbook or something that says this is the easiest way to mute someone because there's a few different ways. And then like um, how to, you, you might want to have people turn off the, the video for participants unless someone's in the meeting with them. So they can't just go in and blare some random video. Uh, that's these are just kind of things that you can do. It's really hard when you have a lot of people in a meeting, but when you have a, an office hours, it's a lot easier. Yeah, that's a great idea. And we don't have any documentation at all for people who are hosting those. So I can take that action item to write something out um, and add it to the handbook uh, just to help people who are hosting. Yeah, 
And we'll keep poking around. Um, I think Vinod had also, um, in a conversation he and I had, mentioned something about um, there's a way, apparently, you can only keep a Zoom channel open during certain hours. And if it's outside of those hours, then you can open it, but like someone would have to request permission. So if we kept it, you know, like here's here's this block of time that is open for whoever in the community wants to use the channel. Um, anything outside of that, you have to you would have to get approval from us, and we will give you like the the ability to open it up, something like that. So that might be an option too. Um, I don't know if we have that that option uh, since we are kind of limited on our Zoom, but we can also maybe look into that as a as a way to keep people from abusing the Zoom channel while we're not around. Um, and if, if anyone else has any ideas or has seen things that work in other communities or other ideas, just let us know. You can pop it in Slack or let me know. I mean, I think giving people the who run the office hours, there's like a host on all of those now. So that's good. And if somebody's using the channel at 1 a.m., I don't like, <laughs> I don't know. Like, I mean, I don't want the cloud recordings of it necessarily, but. Well, they probably can't because they can't log yeah. in as, right, they can right. in as regular people. So they're just yeah. like, they're using it like they would use a Google Meet. I mean, it. Like a stolen quarter to put in one of those old pay phones to make a call. <laughs> They're like hanging out in the channel. That's a little weird, but <laughs> well, I'm wondering that would that catch my I, I I put it in the Slack, but I accidentally joined a yoga class at the Chaos Community <laughs> last week. So like I'm assuming it would also like prevent idiots like me from forgetting to sign out. Um, <laughs> I've done I've done stuff like that too. Oh my gosh! Like I said, it's. <laughs> Chaos has attended many university meetings. Yeah. is a community of many interests. Yeah. Uh, I'm not terribly concerned about like any of those things, to be honest with you. You know, as long as when, when we're having meetings, there's always a, a host that if somebody's Zoom bombing, we can kick people out, which we always seem to have. That seems to be the biggest thing right now. Yeah, hi, it's Ildiko here. I mean, if it really is a concern, I think there is a, a setting that says that um, Zoom will not allow people to join without a host, but then you have to make sure that there is someone with host privileges on every community-related call that is supposed to happen. So that can be challenging. Um, I do manage a Zoom account for a community and um, Honestly, dealing with the modifications and stuff sometimes is more complicated than just letting these, I don't know, hopefully accidents happen every now and then, unless someone is abusing to the account to the extent where the recordings in the cloud just grow in um, above a certain limit. That's definitely something to worry about. I personally never really had that problem uh, before with uh, that other community's Zoom account. When it comes to Zoom bombing, never ever let anyone to post the link on any social media account because then you will get so many bombers that you practically have to shut down that bridge for, for that hour or meeting. We did have that experience once or twice when someone forgot that social media is not for Zoom links <laughs> to, uh, to share those. So I think if, if um, we have that guideline that kind of just tells about all this, that that should help. When we have an online event uh, where we are using Zoom, we kind of try to make sure that we have like redirects for the links and just something that doesn't point directly to the, the Zoom bridge with the password. And just, again, not putting anything on social media. Um, if you have kind of a step that people have to take, like, oh, this is where you find info and then they have to go there and click on a button or something that the Zoom bombers usually don't really get that far. I think it's kind of not how they do this. Um, if they see, see something directly, then they take it. If they have to click on links and buttons and stuff, then, then they will not. So if it's like embedded in a meeting invite, 
in a button, um, in the Google Doc uh, that we have, I think that should be good enough to hide it in, in our experience. But again, these are just kind of uh, what we tried to do so far. So yeah, plus one, two or a thousand for having guidelines to make sure that anyone who's running a Zoom call uh, knows all the best practices. And then um, fingers crossed that it will be sufficient enough. Super helpful. Thank you so much, Ilipo. That is really, really helpful context and information. Um, so we will get that all down in the guidelines for hosts. So thank you for that input. Uh, we are, oh, we're at the end of time and we had two discussions from previous meetings that we did not get along or get to. So we will bump those up to the very first thing that we talk about next week. Um, if those, if one of those things are your things, I'm so sorry, we did not get to them. We'll really get to them first next time. So, Chaos um, will meet again. We will. Same time, same place next week. So thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day and week, and we will see you next time. Bye. 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 Thank you.